I'm Salvatore Babonis, and today's lecture is The Syrian Refugee Crisis, Lessons and Comparisons. For 15 years, the issue of irregular migration by sea has been a dominant theme in Australian politics, despite relatively small numbers of boat arrivals by European standards. Through aggressive interception and, frankly, extreme repression, Australia has, quote-unquote, stopped the boats from reaching Australia, though it has not stopped them from leaving Sri Lanka and Indonesia. Is Australia's model a successful example to be followed, or is it impractical for problems on a world scale, like those being experienced in the Middle East today? And is the Australian solution morally acceptable, either for Europe or even for Australia? Australia consistently attracts irregular migrants by sea who come seeking asylum from conflicts in Sri Lanka, Afghanistan, uh, and elsewhere in the Middle East, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. These uh, sea arrivals to Australia reached a maximum of over 20,000 uh, in 2013 and were a major factor in the 2013 election that uh, resulted in the uh, change in government uh, from uh, the Labour Party to the Liberal National Coalition. Uh, the Liberal National Coalition that uh, came in under Tony Abbott in 2013 had a uh, renewed pledge to stop the boats, but that's hardly new since every Australian government since 2001 has pledged to stop the boats <laughs> with a succession of ever more draconian measures. Uh, John Howard, uh, the Liberal Prime Minister in the early 2000s, uh, came up with the Pacific Solution. Asylum seekers were redirected to camps on Christmas Island, Manus Island, and Nauru. Uh, there was indefinite detention for unsuccessful refugee claimants, meaning that uh, if people uh, arrived seeking refugee status uh, and their cases were turned down, uh, they simply would stay in detention on a remote desert island until they eventually relented and agreed to go back to their home countries, uh, no matter what the risks involved. Obscure legal practices hidden from public scrutiny uh, characterize uh, the Pacific Solution. Uh, the government, uh, the Australian government, keeps a uh, very uh, closed hand keeping camps closed to uh, press scrutiny, closed even to court scrutiny, uh, attempting as much as possible to uh, keep the dirty laundry out of sight uh, on these remote locations. Beginning in 2013, uh, Australia's actions became even more extreme by international standards, with uh, boats being simply turned back uh, to Indonesia. There are press accounts and anecdotal accounts of uh, asylum seekers being uh, loaded onto rescue rafts pointed towards Indonesia and just let go, and their uh, original boats being sunk by Aus the Australian Navy. Uh, it's difficult to know what actually happened because of the extreme secrecy uh, surrounding these interceptions. Uh, the government doesn't give any information on them, not even the number. It uh, routinely uh, refuses even to confirm or deny the existence of these operations. Uh, meanwhile, of course, uh, the press are completely excluded, uh, with the exception of a small number of courageous investigative journalists who uh, join the boats in Indonesia. <laughs> it's risking their own lives to see what's happening when they arrive in Australia or don't arrive in Australia, as the case may be. Australia accepts just 13,750 refugees a year through regular channels. That means through actual applications where a person has the opportunity to apply at a, an Australian embassy or consulate uh, for a humanitarian visa to come to Australia. An additional 12,000 have been pledged for 2015-2016 uh, to accommodate refugees from the Syrian civil war. Uh, obviously, these numbers are very small, uh, not just in absolute terms, but also for a country of Australia's size, of 24 million people. Uh, Australia is uh, six times the size of a country like uh, Lebanon, which has taken in 
uh, some 1.5 million refugees. If the EU wants to follow the Australian example, and this has routinely appeared as a suggestion in the press and in opinion columns in the European Union, uh, this would require cooperation from origin countries. Uh, Australian pushbacks are only possible uh, because the Indonesian authorities allow it. Uh, if Indonesia similarly were to push people back towards Australia, uh, there would be serious consequences. Uh, the origin countries in this case are uh, mostly in the central Mediterranean, Libya and Tunisia, especially Libya because of its ongoing civil war, and uh, in the eastern Mediterranean, Turkey uh, with the connection to Greece. There's a much smaller flow from uh, Morocco and Algeria to Spain. It's much smaller because Morocco and Algeria are both very aggressive in law enforcement uh, to prevent boats from leaving their countries. Uh, so people smuggling and uh, boat departures are severely restricted in Morocco and Algeria uh, by strong national governments that uh, in order to remain on good terms with the European Union, uh, cooperate with the European Union by preventing people smuggling out of their countries. So the two main routes are the central and the eastern Mediterranean routes. Uh, the main route for arrivals right now in, in late 2015 and early 2016 has been the Greek or eastern Mediterranean route from Turkey. As a result, in March 2016, the European Union signed a series of agreements with Turkey uh, to cooperate in ending irregular migration. Uh, the basic deal is that the European Union will resettle 72,000 Syrian refugees a year directly from Turkish refugee camps uh, to uh, asylum in Europe. In exchange, Turkey will take back an equivalent number of irregular migrants who have arrived by sea and been denied asylum in the European Union. This is supposed to be a one-for-one -one trade uh, for every person that uh, Turkey takes back from the European Union. The European Union will resettle one refugee uh, from Turkey. The trick here is that people have to voluntarily agree to be returned to Turkey. Now, this implies that in all likelihood, the people going back to Turkey will be people who wanted of their own accord to go back anyway. Uh, in other words, uh, this is not going to be a, an absolute reduction or return of asylum seekers. This is going to be uh, this the natural flow that uh, inevitably in a population of uh, a million asylum seekers a year, uh, somebody will have reason to want to go back to their families in Pakistan or Afghanistan or Iran, and that small number of people will voluntarily go back at European Union expense. Uh, this does not sound like a rational basis for discouraging people from coming to Europe in the first place. Uh, also, the fact that uh, this plan is uh, limited to 72,000 people per year uh, seems to invalidate the whole process since uh, Europe is receiving about 100,000 uh, refugees per month <laughs> from Turkey uh, via boat arrivals. So the plan itself does not seem very realistic. Now there are some accusations that European Union Coast Guards have been pushing boats back to Turkish waters in the same way that Australia pushes boats back to Indonesia and Sri Lanka, uh, but very little evidence of this. There's much more evidence that uh, the European Union Coast Guards are providing assistance for refugees and helping them in. Uh, there doesn't seem to be much appetite among security forces in the European Union uh, to be involved in the sort of uh, pushback operations that the Australian Navy is doing uh, in, in the Pacific. Uh, there is the possibility that the Turkish Coast Guard will become responsible for pulling back boats. Uh, we know much less about that. Uh, Turkey is a relatively authoritarian state that has a tight control 
uh, on the media and uh, on reporting in general. Uh, so we'll have to see whether or not Turkey uh, takes action on its side to prevent people leaving. Uh, there seems to be little motivation for it to do so uh, other than uh, European Union aid. Now, the European Union has pledged uh, to spend four, about four billion dollars, about three billion euros, to help Turkey feed, house, and school Syrian refugees already in Turkey. The European Union has also pledged in the long run to allow visa-free travel in Europe to Turkish citizens. Uh, both of these pledges are conditional on uh, quote-unquote good Turkish behavior uh, in executing these deals and in upholding refugees' human rights. So it's very questionable, given the character of the regime in Turkey, uh, whether or not this uh, whether or not Turkey will uh, actually receive the European aid it's been promised. And if Turkey doesn't get the aid, Turkey is very unlikely to cooperate in preventing uh, boat departures in the way that uh, Algeria and Morocco have done. In addition, there is a nascent uh, civil war, or at least civil conflict, restarting in Turkey uh, between uh, Turkish security forces and Kurdish militants in the east of Turkey, uh, it seems very likely that in addition to Syrian refugees fleeing Turkey, we might see an additional wave of Kurdish refugees fleeing Turkey for Europe. And if in fact the European Union gives visa-free travel to Turkish citizens, these Kurdish minority citizens of Turkey uh, might become yet another wave of refugees coming from Turkey to Europe. So uh, watch this space on the EU-Turkish agreement. Uh, it is possible, but in my view very unlikely that it will be successful in stemming the flow of refugees from Turkey to Europe. If the Turkish route is closed into Greece, uh, one problem is that migration won't stop. Uh, migration will simply move to the much more dangerous uh, Central Europe, Central Mediterranean route uh, from Libya and Tunisia into uh, Lampedusa, Malta, and Sicily. Um, these maritime uh, crossings in the in the Central Mediterranean uh, are much more dangerous because they involve much longer stretches of open ocean, uh, and the oceans are uh, much rougher than the oceans or the seas separating the Greek islands from the Turkish mainland. Uh, so, even if the uh, negotiations, negotiations with Turkey are successful, it seems unlikely uh, that Europe will be able to stop these migration flows. They'll simply shift to another route, uh, another and more dangerous route. Uh, with this route, there is no mechanism for Europe to uh, prevent uh, departures from Libya because Libya is a country at civil war with no functioning government. Pushbacks or returns to Libya uh, would involve returning refugees to the country in the middle of a civil war, uh, which would seem uh, completely unacceptable in anybody's uh, moral dictionary. There's no governing authority in Libya with the authority uh, to accept pushbacks. So there's no one to negotiate with, uh, only a series of local warlords uh, governing individual cities along the Libyan coast. Uh, besides, the number of people involved, uh, you know, 100,000 people per month for Europe compared to an absolute high of 2,000 per month for Australia, uh, really seem to make these solutions unrealistic for Europe. So the key takeaways are that, first, Australia's Pacific solution and Operation Sovereign Borders have been quote-unquote successful on their own terms. Uh, if the goal is to prevent people from settling in Australia, no matter what the cost, uh, these operations have succeeded in doing that. Uh, of course, those terms are very narrow. Uh, the Pacific Solution and Operation Sovereign Borders uh, have not stopped people from 
uh, risking sea crossings. Uh, they've not prevented thousands of people from languishing in detention centers. Uh, they have not uh, prevented the cost to the Australian government, the massive cost of maintaining these offshore centers and this constant naval presence at sea. Second, the EU-Turkey agreement plans for the voluntary repatriation of up to 72,000 migrants per year, but the voluntary nature suggests that uh, the people going back will simply be uh, people wanting, uh, simply put, a, a free trip home, uh, not people who are actual refugees uh, fleeing danger. Uh, it seems very unlikely that uh, refugees whose lives are threatened at home will voluntarily return uh, with no uh, incentive or reward. Finally, Europe will almost certainly be forced to accommodate refugees rather than push them back on the Australian model. Even if European governments and the European Union decided that the Australian model was morally acceptable, uh, in the European context, it probably is simply impractical. Uh, the rich countries of Europe uh, will simply have to accept uh, that they uh, have to participate in this global social problem uh, of resettling people seeking refuge uh, from wars on their borders. Thank you for watching this uh, lecture. You can find out more about me at salvatorbobonus.com, where you can also sign up for my monthly newsletter on global affairs.